story of why Irish immigrants decided to come to the United States can't be told based on a single cause or event. Different waves of Irish immigrants came from different parts of Ireland at different times for very different reasons. Ireland has historically been divided into four provinces, Connacht, Leinster, Munster, and Ulster. During the colonial era, about half of the Irish came from just one province, Ulster, in Northern Ireland. In 1593, the Gaelic lords of Ulster staged an unsuccessful Irish rebellion. They were defeated in 1603, just prior to King James I taking the English throne. In 1607, the leaders of the rebellion fled to Europe and their lands were confiscated by the English crown. As a result, the new king found himself in control of a large amount of land seized mainly from those who had lost the war. Seeking to secure the region, James granted the lands to English Protestant lords and created what came to be known as the Plantations of Ulster. He appointed as Attorney General to Ireland a man by the name of John Davies. Davies said of Ireland that it was, quote, a barbarous country must be first broken by a war before it will be capable of good government. When it is fully subdued and conquered, if not well planted and governed by after conquest, it will eftsoons return to its former barbarism. These English Protestant lords brought in a large number of tenants to work the land, and the law required these tenants be English-speaking Protestants loyal to the crown, although some accounts agree that Catholics managed to get around the law. The two largest groups that came over were the Scottish settlers from the Scottish lowlands, who tended to be Presbyterian, and the Northern English who tended to follow the Church of England. Another wave of Scottish Presbyterians moved across the Irish Sea around 1630, when James's son, Charles I, pushed to force the Scottish into the Church of England. This push became an outright war in 1638, causing even more people from Scotland and Northern England to move to Ulster. All of these newcomers receiving huge land grants caused a great deal of resentment and anger. In addition to those loyal to the former Gaelic lords in the north, Irish Catholic leaders in the south were very concerned about the ongoing anti-Catholic sentiment in England, and wanted to act preemptively while England was already dealing with another uprising. So in 1641, a large number of Irish Catholic lords staged a rebellion. Initially, leaders of the rebellion hoped they might be able to convince Scottish Protestants to join them in an anti-English coalition, but those hopes were destroyed after Irish rebel groups engaged in a series of attacks on Protestant settlers that became known as the Ulster Massacre. During the attacks, it's estimated between four and 12,000 died either from direct violence, disease, or exposure after being forcibly evicted from their homes. As a result, the rebellion became as much Protestant versus Catholic as it was Irish versus English. Conflicts around how to pay to fight the Irish helped drive England itself into a civil war between the king and the parliament. While the English were fighting amongst themselves, the conflict in Ireland remained in a stalemate for several years. Eventually, Oliver Cromwell and his new model army won the English Civil War, beheading King Charles and taking control of England. That done, Cromwell's army crossed the Irish Sea to brutally squash the Irish Rebellion. This was the cause of another wave of Irish immigrants to America, this time from Southern Ireland, as Cromwell sent a large number of Irish Catholic prisoners of war to the colonies to make sure they could not attempt another uprising. In fact, of the estimated 10,000 Irish Catholics who came to the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War, about 8,000 were penal transports to the Chesapeake Bay Colony. Of those, 40 to 50 percent likely died before completing their prison term or forced indenture. Colonial America, like most of England, was not a very welcoming location for Catholics. Massachusetts banned Quakers, Jews, and Catholics, and Virginia banned priests and did not allow Catholics the right to vote or testify in court. In 1650, there were only five Catholic churches in the entirety of the American British colonies, and all of them were in Maryland. And even in Maryland, whether Catholicism was allowed or not allowed depended on which governor was in power at the time. Back in Ireland, many of the Protestant soldiers who came over with Cromwell decided to remain, mainly in Ulster. Even more Scottish Protestants came over to Ulster around 1690 when a famine broke out in Scotland, leading the once underpopulated region to grow rapidly and spice all the war. It's estimated that in 1600 there were about 1.4 million people in all of Ireland. By 1700 it had roughly doubled, and by the time of the American Revolution in 1776 it's estimated there were nearly 4 million people in Ireland. This population growth meant that families who had come to Northern Ireland for land just a few generations before now found those land plots being subdivided more and more. As a result, from around 1710 to just before the American Revolution, over 200,000 people emigrated from just Northern Ireland to the British colonies. These later became known as the Scotch-Irish. These immigrants were mainly Protestant farmers, many paying for passage through indentured servitude, most arriving in port cities like Philadelphia, Baltimore, or Charleston, with more debt than money. These migrants moved to the frontier areas such as Appalachia and the early Midwest, basically anywhere the land was cheap or Scottish rights were favorable. However, occupying these lands was often in direct violation of treaties signed by the British with Native Americans, spurring both localized conflicts and larger-scale wars with the Native Americans, including the French and Indian and Pontiac Wars. 
In central Pennsylvania, some Native Americans had been pushed out decades prior and negotiated with Quaker authorities to have a small settlement that came to be known as the Conestoga Indian Town. In 1718, a 16,000-acre tract of land that encompassed the village, which was held by William Penn and his heirs, was set aside for the use of the Conestoga. In 1730, a group of Scotch-Irish squatters attempted to occupy the land, arguing it was, quote, against the laws of God and nature that so much land should be idle, while so many Christians wanted to labor on it to raise their bread. While these specific squatters were evicted, over time the Penn family did sell off the vast majority of the original 16,000 acres that were promised, until the Conestoga were left with only 500 acres. Starting in 1738, a Presbyterian congregation near Lancaster was led by a man by the name of John Elder. John Elder preached that Native Americans were Canaanites that needed to be destroyed. His church organized and hosted a militia that became to be known as the Paxton Boys. Members of this militia fought in both the French and Indian Pontiac Wars and would routinely bring rifles with them to church. Elder himself rose to the rank of colonel. During the French and Indian and Pontiac Wars, the Conestoga had remained neutral. However, due to these conflicts, they found they were no longer able to safely engage in traditional activities such as hunting, out of fear of being mistaken for being hostile and killed. As a result, they more or less were only able to sustain themselves by making a small amount of trading goods and by receiving some rations from the Pennsylvania government. By 1763, only 20 people, 7 men, 5 women, and 8 children remained in the settlement. But Elder and his followers believed, quote, The distinction between friendly and enemy Indians was invalid. All Indians were enemies and must be treated accordingly. On December 14, 1763, more than 50 Paxton boys rode out to the Conestoga Indian town and killed and mutilated six people in their homes before setting the entire village on fire. The remaining 14 who managed to escape were given refuge in a nearby workhouse across the street from the county jail by local German settlers who were known as the Moravians. On December 27, 1763, the Paxton boys broke into the workhouse to murder those who had escaped. A local resident described the aftermath. I saw a number of people running down the street toward the jail, which enticed me and other lads to follow them. At about 60 or 80 yards from the jail, we met from 25 to 30 men, well mounted on horses, with rifles, tomahawks, and scalping knives equipped for murder. I ran into the prison yard, and there, oh, what a horrid sight presented itself to my view. Near the back door of the prison lay an old Indian and his woman, particularly well known and esteemed by the people of the town on account of his placid and friendly conduct. His name was Will Sock. Across him and his native woman lay two children of about the age of three years whose heads were split open with the tomahawks and their scalps all taken off. Toward the middle of the jail yard, along the west side of the wall, lay a stout Indian whom I particularly noticed to have been shot in the breast. His legs were chopped with the tomahawk, his hands cut off, and finally a rifle ball discharged into his mouth so that his head was blown to atoms and the brains were splashed against and yet hanging to the wall for three or four around. This man's hands and feet had also been chopped off with a tomahawk. In this manner lay the whole of them. Men, women, and children spread about the prison yard, shot, scalped, hacked, and cut to pieces. After committing these murders, men on horses rode through the small village of Lydda's nearby, shouting, God damn you, Moravians, while shooting a quote of volley of shots from their weapons before eventually riding out of town. The governor of Pennsylvania offered a reward for the capture of the ringleaders, but none were ever formally identified despite all parties being well known. No prosecutions occurred, likely because local officials were sympathetic. The murder sparked outrage in Philadelphia where Ben Franklin wrote, among any other people on earth, no matter how primitive, except maybe the Christian white savages of Peckingstang and Donegal. But there was little remorse from John Elder, who wrote to the governor, quote, the storm, which had been so long gathering, has at length exploded. Had government removed the Indians, which had been frequently but without effect urged, this painful catastrophe might have been avoided. What could I do with the men heated to madness? All that I could do was done. I expostulated, but life and reason were set at defiance. Yet the men in private life are virtuous and respectable, not cruel, but mild and merciful. About a month before the massacre, Two other groups of Native Americans who lived near Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, had been moved to Philadelphia for their protection. In February of 1764, the Paxton boys marched on Philadelphia, intending to, quote, put to death all the Indians in the barracks. When the group entered a suburb of Philadelphia, a local was quoted as saying, I have seen hundreds of Indians traveling the country, and I can with truth affirm that the behavior of these fellows was ten times more savage and brutal than theirs. According to this local's account, the group were frightening women by running the muzzles of their guns through windows, swearing and hallowing, attacking men without the least provocation, dragging them by their hair to the ground, and pretending to scalp them. 
The Paxton boys halted the march toward Philadelphia when they learned a much larger force awaited them there. Ben Franklin was sent out by the governor to negotiate with the Paxton boys and convince them to disperse and submit grievances in writing. Once again, none were held accountable. Following this, Ben Franklin wrote, The spirit of killing all Indians, friends and foe, spread amazingly through the whole country. Irish Catholic immigration during this period was very different. Shortly after the Revolution, it's estimated that out of a total population of around 3 million in the United States, only about 25,000 were Catholic, and most of these were not Irish Catholic. This isn't to say Irish Catholics didn't immigrate to the colonies, but more that when they did come, they didn't generally come in large enough numbers to establish independent Irish Catholic communities, and instead appear to have assimilated with existing religious and cultural groups. Scotch-Irish tended to be ardent supporters of the American Revolution. As one British mercenary officer put it, Call this war by whatever name you may, only call it not an American Revolution. It is nothing more or less than a Scotch-Irish Presbyterian Rebellion. A British Major General testified to the House of Commons that, quote, half the Rebel Continental Army were from Ireland. However, for some, this seemed to have been more about opposition to authority than any love for the American experiment. The Scotch-Irish were also some of the largest supporters of the Whiskey Rebellion in 1790. During the Revolutionary War, and for some time after, there was much less emigration from Ireland to the United States, likely because of concerns about the stability of the new nation, but it didn't last. Between 1815 and 1845, around half a million Northern Irish Protestants left Ireland for the United States. These immigrants were less likely to be agricultural workers seeking land on the frontier, and more likely to be skilled laborers and merchants looking for work in urban centers, due to the challenging economic conditions brought on by wars in Europe. In the northern United States, major infrastructure projects like the Erie Canal provided a large number of jobs to Irish immigrants, and as a result, Irish communities emerged and grew in cities like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. In the South, the Louisiana Purchase in 1820 meant that the formerly French Catholic Louisiana Territory was now part of the United States. This acquisition alone likely tripled the total Catholic population in the country. New Orleans had always been a destination for Catholic immigrants, and other cities in the South, such as Charleston and Savannah, began to have growing Catholic communities, which included some Irish Catholics. Even this relatively small increase in Catholic immigration stoked already existing anti-Catholic sentiment, and soon anti-Catholic violence was rampant. Nativist Protestants in the North calling themselves Yankees vandalized Irish Catholic houses and would regularly physically attack Irish Catholics on the streets. On June 19, 1823, a mob of Yankees attacked an Irish Catholic Boston neighborhood by hurling stones through as many windows as they could. In July of 1826, these riots escalated to destroying a number of homes in the community, likely triggered by the simultaneous deaths of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. In 1834, in Charleston, Massachusetts, a Roman Catholic convent was burned to the ground by an angry mob, following rumors that one of the nuns was being held there against her will. The ringleader of the mob confessed, but was still acquitted. As he put it, quote, the testimony against me was point-blank and sufficient to have convicted 20 men, but somehow I proved an alibi, and the jury brought in a victory of not guilty. In Boston, on Sunday, June 11, 1837, a group of firemen came out of a pub and ran into a procession of about 100 Irish Catholics on their way to a funeral. In Boston, the fire departments were volunteer groups mostly made up of Yankees. A fight ensued, and the Yankee firemen were largely outnumbered and found themselves beaten and driven back into their firehouse. At this point, according to news reports, a foreman of the firehouse rang the alarm and rolled the fire wagon into the street, shouting, The Irish have risen upon us and are going to kill us. Another Yankee fire company, believing this was actually a fire, responded, and their wagon ran into the funeral procession crowd, knocking many to the ground. Assuming this was a deliberate attack, another fight ensued. More and more Yankee firefighters came, and more and more Irish Catholics in the community also came out of their homes until it was a full-blown riot. Protestants from other part of the town heard about the uprising and rushed to the Irish Catholic neighborhood. The Irish Catholic, vastly outnumbered, ran back into their homes to hide, but were pulled outside as Yankees entered their homes to throw their positions out into the street. Eventually, the militia was called and the riots were finally put down. In Philadelphia in 1844, rumors had begun to spread that the Catholics were trying to remove the Bible from public schools. On May 6th, a nativist rally turned violent, leading to the destruction of two Catholic churches and other Catholic buildings over several days. In July of that same year, riots broke out in Philadelphia in the weeks that followed a rally by a new nativist anti-Catholic political party that called themselves the Native American Party. The riots escalated to the point that both the nativists and government authorities trying to put down the fighting fired cannons at each other, and at least 15 died. In both instances, grand juries declined to prosecute any of the nativists. This anti-Catholic sentiment is likely why, up to this point in American history, Irish Catholics were more often found in small minority communities, and arguably Irish Protestants were considered the more the norm when discussing Irish immigration. 
That all changed in 1845. That year, Ireland reached what was then and is still today its highest population of all time of over 8 million people. This growth occurred despite wars and extreme poverty over much of the land. And of course, with all the waves of immigration we've discussed so far, people leaving Ireland. So how was Ireland able to continue to grow in population with all of these things occurring? The potato. More specifically, one type of potato. Potatoes were not native to Europe, and the specific potato, which was the most popular in Ireland at the time, originated not just from South America, but from very Southern South America, in what is modern-day Chile. This variety came from so far south that, in fact, this type of potato only came to North America by way of European settlers and not Native Americans. This variety grew well in very northern latitudes in Ireland, which mirrored the very southern latitudes of Chile, but it struggled in the climates between, which is why it never migrated. Potatoes, when combined with the traditional Irish diet of milk and grain, meet a surprising amount of human nutritional needs. And while much of the rest of the Europe was slow to adopt the potato, Irish farmers with few options shifted in desperation. Contrary to myths, people in Ireland didn't just eat potatoes. Bread, milk, and butter generally continued to make up more of the Irish diet than potatoes for most people. But potatoes were what the Irish counted on to survive through the winter when other crops didn't grow. At the same time, nearly everything they did eat depended on the potato in one way or another. Taxes were often paid with wheat or corn, and so Irish farmers added potatoes into feed for livestock, again, particularly to get through the winter. But since nearly every potato grown in Ireland was from the same variety, they also shared the same vulnerabilities. A potato blight began to spread in Ireland in 1845. In the first year, it destroyed nearly half of the potato crop. The next seven years thereafter, it destroyed about three quarters of the potato crop. In the past, Irish Catholics who wanted to leave Ireland faced anti-Catholic discrimination both in England and America, and language barriers elsewhere in Europe. This was a large part of why so many Irish Catholics that stayed in Ireland through the King James Conquest, through Cromwell's invasion, through absentee English landlords, failed rebellions, and general poverty. And despite the infusion of Protestants into Northern Ireland in an effort to convert the population over time, Ireland had remained not only majority Catholic, but nearly 80% Catholic. But the potato blight made it a choice between starvation or emigration. Between 1845 and 1851, about 200,000 Irish left for Great Britain, but around a million chose long-distance destinations such as North America and Australia. Many didn't make it across the ocean. Death rates from disease such as typhoid commonly reached 20% and in some cases as high as 50% on ships, leading many Irish to later refer to these ships as coffin ships. Still many did. Between January 1846 and December 1851, 410,000 Irish passengers arrived in New York City alone. For context, the population of New York in 1840 was 370,000. Unlike previous waves of immigration that were largely young men seeking work or brought through indenture, whole families came. So many of the ship's records coming into New York showed 8,075 births at sea during the journey. One passenger described the journey as, quote, Hundreds of poor people, men, women, and children of all ages, from the driveling idiot of 90 to the babe just born, huddled together without light, without air, wallowing in filth and breathing a fetid atmosphere, sick in body, dispirited in heart. But there was little empathy in some circles. Anti-Catholic sentiment continued to grow. The Native American Party began creating secret societies calling for a return to, quote, temperance, liberty, and Protestantism. These groups formed a number of political parties which were collectively known as the Know Nothing Party, because it was said they claimed to know nothing when asked about politics, preferring to operate in dog whistles. A pre-presidential Abraham Lincoln wrote to a friend of these know-nothings, I am not a know-nothing, that is certain. How could I be? How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? Our progress in degeneracy appears to be pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read, all men are created equal except for Negroes, foreigners, and Catholics. When it comes to that, I would prefer immigrating to some country where they can make no pretense of loving liberty, to Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. But the voters seemed to disagree with Abe. The know-nothings were able to win eight governorships, more than 100 congressional seats, and had mayors in Boston, Philadelphia, and Chicago through the 1850s. In 1854, a branch of the know-nothings that called themselves the American Party managed to capture all the state offices in Massachusetts, the entire state senate, and nearly all of the state house seats. These groups were able to pass laws that demanded the Protestant King James Bible specifically be read in schools, that disbanded all Irish Catholic militias, and that barred even naturalized citizens from being able to vote unless they had been in the country for 21 years. And the know-nothings didn't just use the vote to exert their power. 
In 1854, a mob in Maine dragged a Jesuit priest into the street, stripped him naked, and tarred and feathered him for circulating pamphlets denouncing the King James Bible being used in local schools. And in a separate incident, a mob set fire to a church recently purchased by Irish Catholics. In that same year, Know Nothings in St. Louis brought a local judge to the polls in an effort to reject the votes of Irish Catholics, leading to riots where at least 10 were killed and 33 others were wounded. In Kentucky in 1855, Know Nothing mobs attached Irish Catholic and German neighborhoods in an event that came to be known as Bloody Monday. Local papers reported Louisville was, quote, in possession of an armed mob, the base passions of which were infuriated to the highest pitch by the incendiary appeals of the newspaper Oregon and the popular leaders of the Know Nothing Party. At least 19 were killed, with some reports of over 100 deaths, as entire rows of homes were set on fire with families inside who were shot as they tried to escape. Know Nothing affiliated street gangs formed in most major cities to act as political enforcers through violence targeting immigrants near polling areas, perhaps most famous being the Plug Uglies in Baltimore. But by 1856, as more and more Irish immigrants had arrived, the balance of power had begun to shift. Political rivals of the Know Nothings had been offering help to new immigrants in exchange for votes, seeing that the waves of immigrants, once made citizens, would create a formidable political base. And the Irish Catholic immigrants were well aware that those who had political power could also provide political jobs. But that didn't mean the Know Nothings would stop without a fight. Baltimore, the home of the Plug Uglies, became known as Mob Town due to how much violence and rioting was taking place. In 1856 alone, there were riots on September 12th around the celebration of Baltimore's founding, on October 8th during the municipal elections leading to at least five deaths, and again on November 4th when national elections were held. In the November riots, one of the gangs managed to acquire a cannon and fire it as riots broke out at polling places across the city, and at least 17 people died. But Millard Fillmore, the know-nothing presidential candidate, emerged with enough votes to secure Maryland in the Electoral College. It was the only state he won. And the Plug Uglies were known to travel. In 1857, they traveled down to D.C. from Baltimore to help another know-nothing gang there win a local election. They managed to steal a cannon from the Naval Yard, and in that fight, at least eight people were killed. That same year, the Plug Uglies also went up to New York to help a know-nothing supported group known as the Bowery Boys fight the Irish Catholic Dead Rabbit Gang. The gang fight that transpired lasted for over two days, as the Irish Catholics had grown in number and power to the point where they weren't simply a minority group a mob could intimidate into submission. They had become full equals. In fact, in many areas in the Northeast, Irish Catholics were becoming the dominant political force, forcing at least some level of Protestant acquiescence, if not acceptance. In the South, things were different. Irish Catholics were still a smaller minority and not able to directly wield political power, but they were still able to find some common cause with the white Protestants, support of slavery. Although some Catholic churches in the early part of the 18th century opposed slavery openly, the leaders of those churches were generally targeted for violence. As a result, the Irish Catholics of the South were generally in lockstep support of slavery. Around 20,000 Irish Catholics served in the Confederacy, and six Confederate generals were actually born in Ireland. Some have even argued that the rebel yell at Bull Run was from the Irish immigrants who made up the Stonewall Brigade. In the North, many Irish did support the Union and serve in the Union Army, with estimates of as many as 150,000 Irish soldiers fighting on the Union side. In fact, the first two recorded deaths in the war at Fort Sumter were both born in Ireland. But Irish immigrants were also at the forefront of riots which included targeted racial violence in several cities. The largest of these was in New York City in July of 1863. This riot raged for four days. On the first day, the Colored Orphan Asylum, which provided shelter for over 200 black children, was attacked by a mob and burned to the ground, followed by a large number of black-owned businesses and homes. When the mob was no longer able to burn down black homes and businesses, they began to burn down homes of abolitionists and attacked white women who were known to be involved in interracial relationships. A newspaper account of the time stated, West of Broadway, below 26th, all was quiet at 9 o'clock last night. A crowd was at the corner of 7th Avenue and 27th Street at the time. This was the scene of the hanging of a Negro in the morning, and another at 6 o'clock in the evening. The body of the one hung in the morning presented a shocking appearance at the station house. His fingers and toes had been sliced off, and there was scarcely an inch of his flesh which was not gashed. Late in the afternoon, a Negro was dragged out of his house in West 27th Street, beaten down on the sidewalk, pounded in a horrible manner, and then hanged to a tree. Estimates of the death toll were between 100 and as many as 1,200. The New York Times reported that the Know Nothing gang, the Plug Uglies, had come up from Baltimore to join with the Irish Catholic Dead Rabbits gang in the violence. Apparently, these two rival gangs had now found they had one common cause to unite them. Violence against blacks. History is awkward.